right, you gloriously miserable accursed. Let's get this pod underway. I'm David Hurley. With me, the political panel who every week comes on here to put this, this, the cuss in disgust and the shite in insight. Corey Tonight, Jordan Leichtitz, Scott Reed. Before we get started today... Wait, the wait, wait. The shite? Of- the shite in insight? Are we going to let Rosenberg get away with this? Is he drift? Is he like the federal liberals? Is he drifting here as we lose uh, these last few days of the year? Just Come on. I think he had to pull it line. together quickly. I think he had to pull it together quickly. Uh, you didn't respond to the topics email. All right. Uh, Before we get started today, I have a small ask. Rest. A Hurley holiday favor. Please go to Apple Ratings and Reviews. And give your opinion of the show, good or bad. Give a comment, give a rating. We learn from all of it. Five stars, Jordan says. But, you know, that might not be your choice, but we'd appreciate it if it was. Anyway, they help the show. They give us some feedback. It's great. Please do it. All right, here's today. The conservative house procedural shenanigans, complete with performative late-night McDonald's ordering. Strategically, does this stuff do any good? Did anybody care what happened in the House comments last week? Galen Weston back in front of a committee last week defending his company on food inflation. Uh, we're looking at a grocery code of conduct. There's some competition stuff in the in the uh, in Parliament. Is this thing going to be a political winner for the government? And our cursed clipping is from Allison Jones of Canadian Press. In the Star this week, Ontario's Auditor General says Doug Ford spent about $25 million on partisan political ads. Well, we will dive into government advertising and whether it's partisan or not or good or bad and how it's used. Give a little primer on government advertising in this show. And then the great Mr. Pinson calls up for our hey use. Scott Corey Jordan, happy anniversary of the Statute of Westminster Day. I do this for Kevin Bosch, who may be listening. <laughs> And we'll certainly appreciate a tidbit like this. How are you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. He- he- heavily into Christmas parties and office parties and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I, I went to two actually this week with uh, with Mr. Scott Reed. Were you at the um, McCord party? Were you at the Scott McCord party? Sure was. We were both present. Yep. And, yeah, I wish uh, I could have been there for Scott. He's done so much for me over the years. Great man. It, it was pretty fun. They had a they had a big board up where you had to put a pin on where Scott saved you from in the past. <laughs> <laughs> All the places, the far flung spots he's rescued you from. Yeah, That's awesome. where, where, where Scott rescued you from? Um, yeah, and and uh, it had the uh, a grand opening of uh, a new office for for Rubicon Strategy Inc. And uh, that was fun. congratulations on that. Thank you. That For those of you listeners who out there who don't know, wait, wait, wait. Scott I McCord, tell you just about- wait, just wait. I just want to say to everybody out there who's listening and doesn't know, because they wouldn't, is Scott McCord is the travel agent to everybody in politics in Ottawa. Anybody who's ever met Scott McCord uses him as their travel agent. Yep. He is simply a different character, a different level of service in that area than anybody else can provide. There's no question about it. It's very He's, true. He, he is a magician. He is a David, David Copperfield of travel. He can <laughs> he, he he can make an uh, an elephant disappear, and he can get me <laughs> home from Costa Rica as COVID shuts down the entire planet. So more importantly, you um, can get an elephant to disappear at a J class, so you can. You can <laughs> <laughs> the, the great thing about the party was that there were at least a dozen people at it who had never laid eyes yeah. on Scott. They right. knew him only as a person on the other end of the telephone. We're talking relationships of 20 years who had mm-hmm. never physically met him. Right. And he's not a great phone relationship building guy. It can be crusty. It can be a fraud. <laughs> I can't ever imagine anyone being crusty dealing with you guys in crisis. <laughs> I have My a favorite hard time. line. Well, I, I got to. I got to. First throw fucking boat out. First fucking boat out. I remember that phone call from him. I'm like, okay, I guess that means I go now. I pack. <laughs> I, uh, I I got to throw a plug out uh, as well for uh, for our office opening. We had had a, a really great setup, I think. But uh, it was uh, thanks to Natalie Goldberg Fife, who's uh, no longer with uh, Visa, but is doing private events and that sort of thing. And so anyone out there who's looking to uh, do something like that, I I couldn't give her a higher recommendation. I'll second that. What impressed you about this swishy event, Scott? It was a very shishi event and it was, it was beautifully catered by Nally and everything was kind of, you know, perfectly appointed. And then my favorite part of the entire festive event 
other than the alcohol, naturally, is that uh, Corey was uh, hosting a private screening of new negative advertising against Bonnie Crombie in his office. And he was just proudly <laughs> paroling the hall saying, come, 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 look at this. I've got a rough <laughs> cut. A plus trolling. And I yeah, my favorite part That's was great. when former right. Ontario Liberal leader Steve Del Duca found himself grabbed by his uh, fishing vest and was dragged into uh, <laughs> Corey's office to, uh, to, to, to look at it. He didn't quite know how to react, I don't think. He's like, well, yeah. I guess it's good. I don't, it's bad. What am I supposed to say? I'm a mayor now. Leave me out of this. Yeah, yeah I, I think he said something along the lines so of, I'm glad I'm not the leader anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. As are many. <clears throat> so you have ads ready, Corey. Mm -hmm. You'll be seeing them on your television and online platforms uh, in uh, the coming weeks. Uh, probably, I guess, starting this week, you'll start to see them. Right, right they congratulate right. Bonnie Crombie cool. on her victory. Uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're very I charitable. I want to make sure that, that Corey took Scott's earnest advice that, that negative advertising <laughs> could give Bonnie a bit of an advantage. You really, you consider that carefully, right? Yeah, I, 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 uh, we thought long and hard. Uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's a welcome present, and we're all about being collegial in politics here in Ontario. So, uh, you know, it's a big public welcome. All right. It's well, a big advertising bat that he's going to slam across Bonnie's head. So I am begging you, if you are an Ontario <laughs> liberal, dig into your pocket now. They need money. Okay, like they need money. Can they need a million dollars just bastards. for her salary. So you know, they, <laughs> <laughs> like Act One of Office that is, is, the is a fundraising pay for appeal. Itself, Scott, <laughs> hey, I gotta, I gotta be kept in uh, Birkin bags and Hermes scarves. So That's yeah, right. well, that shit ain't cheap. <clears throat> the, she's got to, she's got to do that stuff till she's got a kid ready to get married, and then she can have a stag and dough right? and make her money that way. <laughs> That's right. Pillow, <laughs> pillowcases O developer. Um, All right. <clears throat> I have a cold. Not the COVID Terry had this week, but I have a cold. Sorry about that. Okay. So listen, guys. And Jordan. Um, there was an all night filibuster in the House of Commons last week. I have never been able to think of anything as boring as the House of Commons. So I don't know anything about it, and I never follow it. I saw a picture of Polyev with some bags of McDonald's food. I saw Trudeau hugging a conservative MP at the end of it. That's pretty much all I know. The conservatives precipitated this. Corey, why would they do such a thing? What was the point? Well, to talk about carbon tax and to do the, the primary job of the opposition, which is to oppose. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that you actually saw anything around this, I think, is a sign of success. Because normally, when are you tuning into the House of Commons at all? When does it make news at this time of year? Almost never. So, you know, uh, what's a good comms plan? You know, what message do you want to talk about? And what uh, different ways can we creatively come up with to put that in front of people? And but, I'll, talk but I'll, be, I'll be honest, I didn't hear anything about the carbon tax, to be honest. That didn't really penetrate from the noise. It just seemed like, and I'm being honest here, Corey, I'm just trying to say, I didn't hear that. I just heard a bunch of noise. I just heard partisan fighting and people trying to claim this or that. But I didn't get an overall message that this was about the tax. So, you know, that's a, perhaps a, a, a critique on, on complete execution of it, but uh, I certainly saw carbon tax in a, in a lot of the coverage. Okay. And uh, I think you saw the opposition party opposing the government and, you know, frankly, doing their job. Mm. Right. Scott, you were making a rude gesture while Corey was talking. <laughs> gesture you have of a different masturbatory jerking raw. Yeah. <laughs> so it was the same gesture that Billy Corgan uh, gave to the audience after uh, uh, playing a hit at uh, the Smashing Pumpkins. Um, I, I, uh, uh, I was making a rude gesture to suggest uh, that I regarded it all as uh, partisan masturbation, which is what I regarded it. I don't, I, I, I don't think it, I, I've had to probably talk on TV about this thing five times in the past week, and I don't think it's worth two seconds talk because I, I honestly don't believe that it has any uh, strategic value. All this argument, this uh, what I find to be tortured, precious argument that it further associates the conservatives with the combat against the carbon tax. I don't believe any of that. 
Um, I also, for what it's worth, I'm not, I, I, I don't buy the, the liberal argument, which is that it boomeranged on them and it gave the liberals an opportunity to uh, fill their stockings with evidence. Don't you know that, that Polyev wasn't there the whole time? And well, I'll, I'll come back to that. But all this stuff about, <laughs> oh, he voted against this and they voted against that. And now we've got all this uh, ammo against them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. I don't buy any of that. I think people just saw clowns acting like clowns. I think it, it just, uh, it, it further. Uh, fortifies people's assumption that nothing of value goes on down there and that just deepens people's cynicism about politics. I will say uh, two things on the margins of it. One, none of which I uh, want to pretend matter, okay? But I do think an interesting byproduct of it is I am convinced that oddly it had a rallying effect for liberals. Like they actually got... Like it kind of in a weird way brought the Liberal Caucus together, the kind of all night forced thing. And they're like, we're in this fight together and all this stuff. And it's been such a slew of bad news and it's been such a difficult time and a difficult slog for them. I think that. You mean a rally the caucus? It. Yes, caucus. Not and liberals. I, I, Right. Okay. Caucus. So, but I just, uh, but it's been a rain cloud of a, a of a couple months for them, and I just I noticed yeah. that, and I think that was a genuine emotion. Um, and then I do think that you know Polyev's absence, while no one notices it except for people who are watching closely, like you know, come on, man, like. It's an astonishing lack of conviction. You're going to start this thing. You're the kind of general that's ain't going to like barrel off the battlefield while the fight happens. You know, like so. You know, like. It's just nothing could send a clear signal that this was just absolute horseshit partisan politics and the fact that Polyev demands this and then can't even mail in an effort to be there and cast votes. He didn't want to stay up past 10 o'clock. He couldn't be bothered to be there. And I just think that, you know, to me, it's just like an IMAX sized advertisement for how it's just pure tactics, horseshit. So I don't think it makes any difference. I don't think it has any lasting impact. Um, but I think it tells us something we already know about Polyev, which is that it's, you know, it, it's all uh, tricks up the sleeve. Jordan had yeah, some I distance mean, and perspective from this. Didn't have a dog yeah, yeah. in the fight, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I think I'm largely, I'm largely in agreement with Scott, although not on it being inconsequential. I think it was actually, in the end, actively harmful for the Conservatives. It was a dumb move. And I think we should all acknowledge that we've arrived at the point in the season where these tactical decisions are being made in the worst possible way and people are tired and whatever. But even, even given that, that I, it was dumb for a bunch of reasons. So the first one is nobody off the hill is going to notice. But if they do, you just look obstructionist. Like you just look like you're just trying to like you're an arsonist. You're just trying to like block things. Uh, I don't think the message about the carbon price got out at, at all in the coverage. Um, but more importantly, in this, Polyev made a threat that he couldn't fucking back up. He's going to make the House sit through Christmas. Come on, they disposed of these votes in 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 thirty hours. So he looks, I'm going to cancel your vacation. Yeah, he looks weird. He oh. looks like he doesn't know what, he, what the fuck he's talking about. So he made this threat, and then. As Scott pointed out, and then he departs, right? So he leaves his hapless caucus to <laughs> sit through the night uh, while he goes off to do other things. Uh, and I think that, well, we all can agree that most people didn't notice any of this. I think the people there did notice his absence. I think it harmed whatever potential positive message the Conservatives might have had about him sticking it to the government when the prime minister, who I think we can all agree hasn't shown a lot of spark lately, actually turned up, was actually voting overnight. I, I think that they created that opportunity for Trudeau um, and he walked right into it. I do think that this type of a vote where you're going line by line, it actually does give, uh, give your opponents ammunition when you start voting against specific program funding even if it's short-lived, but they were out there voting against a school lunch program and the NDP was able to spin off a video. They voted against Operation Unifier and the Ukrainian Canadian Congress noticed. So like this shit does actually have an impact a little bit outside of the bubble when you start going after things line by line. So I, and, and clearly in the, those instances, the messaging of the carbon tax did not supersede any potential damage that, that happened there. And the last thing, and Scott raised this, and I actually think this is the most important, is that this unifies your opposition. Like people in the House 
MPs, they complain, but they love this shit. This is like, they get, they bring out the guitars, they hang out in the lobby, they shoot the shit. These are people who at this time of year hate each other, Michael right? Michael Rowe, you're about to <laughs> yeah. shore. Hey, you everybody! Know, we, may all, we may Play all cringe. Play wagon wheel. Play wagon wheel. We may all cringe. But the reality is, that this actually really can consolidate caucuses and bring people closer together and give them a sense of purpose, simple and and, and short-sighted as it is. And, and that's actually, frankly, really a gift to the Liberals who've had such a brutal, brutal fall and start to winter. And I think that if you look at, at, at that, you know, really it was just 30 hours, but if you look at coming out of that, I saw a little bit more energy and pep in the liberal step than I did in the conservatives coming out of it. So I think this was a, a, a really a bit of a failure all around for Polyev. You well, know, the only thing I know. was thinking about when I was watching it that's different than that, because I kind of thought it was a failure too, although not a consequential one in my view, but, um, but the one thing I was thinking about is at this time when everything's falling apart around the government, and it looks like things are spiraling out of their control. Is there political advantage in just continuing to create the impression that they're under siege and that they're surrounded by chaos? Yeah. Yes. Uh, that that by, was by, one. Uh, well, yeah, you, I, I, I think yes, but I think you know, you're missing, uh, you guys are all missing a key point on how people actually digest this stuff. Like this isn't for the audience, audience of 18 people watching CPAC. Uh, this is for clips. And, you know, Jordan, you'll make the case that, you know, they're going to take clips of some of these votes and and be weaponized against them. But that would require the Liberals to actually have a digital team that does that sort of thing. Yes, which that's I, an excellent I, I, point. I have, I've seen no evidence of. But I have seen a team that does actually take this content from the House of Commons on a daily basis, packages it into its component parts, and then pushes it out through... Uh, social media to target audiences that would not see it otherwise. And I think, you know, okay. uh, so, yeah, I would say, yeah, there's there's potential for everyone to get some good clips out of uh, what happened there. I only see one team that actually uh, routinely does that and, and then takes advantage of those opportunities. So, you know, maybe it's a little too, too soon to tell, but I, you know, uh, all things being equal, I know which team's likely to do that and which one isn't. Uh, uh, just two quick last things. One, uh, and this is probably the only important thing about this, or what I think is fundamentally unimportant uh, episode. And, and that is your point, David, that it, because it does breed, I think, cynicism, I don't think any people would people withdrew a message. They withdrew an impression. The impression is that shit's not getting done and shit doesn't work. And I think that probably in a perverse way, even though the conservatives are the author of it, it works against the government. And so that's kind of a depressing thing, you know, like, hey, uh, I'll foul the nest and then say this nest has been fouled. The only other little thing for the conservatives, this line about, oh, this is, you know, so smart because of the carbon tax and so forth. I just think, you know, when you're 19 points ahead, and when you're doing 15 minute videos where you whack off and you convince yourself it's a documentary, you gotta be very careful not to be sitting around saying, this is a strategic idea. Why? Because it's my idea and everything I do is strategic. It starts to become, you know, a little bit uh, a fool's gold. And I'm not predicting that, you know, they're before pride goeth before the fall or anything like that, but they better uh, like, Right now, it feels like Polyev thinks he can do no wrong and that everything he does is smart because he did it. And I just think that's a that's a bad wavelength to get. Well, this is where brain. we've seen them trip before. Right. This is it's it's when they get overconfident and they overreach, the stuff can blow back in their face. And I, I think this straddled the line a bit. All right. Sounds like we've exhausted this already. So let's move on to our clipping. I have to put my reading glasses on for the last week. Next Friday, this coming Friday, sorry, I get my cataract off. You won't have to see these oh. fucking things again. Yeah, Christ, Congrats. that's disgusting. I get my cataract They're off. They're going to cut into a my eyeball, uh, take a lens out, and put another lens in. How do you feel about that? Nice, yeah, we live in the nice. future. Amazing. Hey, yeah, no. hey are you, uh, are Curly, did they, are they you cut that Kathleen goiter wins? off? Are you going to use Kathleen Wynn's uh, uh, program for private delivery? Of oh, Cataract there we Marivel? go, Corey. I knew you weren't going to be able to resist that one. <laughs> no, he's for a pilot <laughs> program that the Florida government expanded. He's, he's, he's going to park his car uh, <clears throat> at Ontario Place and then uh, spa oh. his eye off. Exactly. I did not jump the queue. That I did not do. 
I spent last week snowed in at my cottage, north of Ottawa. For me, that's a harbinger of three interconnected things. My shoveling efficiency rate, volume per scoop time speed, continues to decline. The holidays are coming up quick, and it's giving season. You all know our presenting sponsor is TELUS. Giving is a core value with them, and there are thousands of ways they demonstrate that all year long. One shiny new initiative is the $50 million TELUS student bursary. It's the largest bursary fund in Canada. TELUS gave a $25 million endowment gift to create it, and continuing support will come from a further $25 million fundraising commitment from the TELUS Friendly Future Foundation. Why the bursary? The average Canadian post-secondary student owes almost $30,000 upon graduation. Two in five students say they're considering withdrawing from school due to financial constraints. And 79% of students report the amount of debt they're obliged to take on is debilitating. So this bursary fund will provide vital support for thousands of students experiencing financial hardship. That's a positive impact that reverberates down through the years. As part of the program, each bursary recipient commits to taking on a project that has a positive social, environmental, or health impact. It's a virtuous circle of giving, Hurley Burleyites, tomorrow's leaders making the world a better place today. The program launched about two months ago, and in this academic year alone, it awarded $2 million to 400 students in financial need. If, during this giving season, you feel you want to add your support to the TELUS student bursary, you can donate at friendlyfuture.com slash bursary. Next week, I'll be back with another giving story. All right, Alison Jones of Canadian Press. I stumbled across this, or Jordan stumbled across this in the Toronto Star, but it's from Canadian Press. Ontario's progressive conservative government spent about $25 million, or three quarters of its total advertising spending, last year on ads the Auditor General believes are partisan. Our office, this is the... um, Auditor speaking, our office concluded that the primary objective of these ads and or information on their respective websites was to foster a positive impression of the government, the AG wrote in the report. Prior to 2015, ads were banned as partisan if the intent was to foster a positive impression of government or a negative impression of its critics. But the then Liberal government amended the rules in that year. Andrew Bevan, God bless you. Now... The Auditor General can only veto an ad as partisan if it uses an elected member's picture, name, or voice, the color or logo associated with the political party, or direct criticism of a party or member of the legislature. Previous Auditor General Bonnie Lysick railed against the changes at the time, as did the Progressive Conservatives when they were in opposition. They promised during the 2018 election to reverse the Liberal rules, but decided otherwise once in government. Two ad campaigns on the health care system and public school funding would not have passed review under those previous rules because they talked about building 3,000 more hospital beds and hiring 3,000 more school staff without evidence, the auditor said. All right, Scott, what's your take on the use of advertising by governments to promote their program? Fuck off, Auditor General. This isn't your job. That's my attitude. And, you know, I... I'm going to rail against, you know, horrifying partisan advertising and so forth. I have to say, in all honesty, the examples cited, I didn't find to be that egregious. And uh, and I don't find the quantum to be that egregious. And I want Doug Ford to lose. And I want Corey uh, to be impoverished. And I want uh, nothing (laughs) but uh, badness. But, like, come on. Uh, I just, I'm sorry, but I, I personally believe that in the current media environment where social media has been broken, hello, Elon, letting Alex Jones back on X, you fucking piece of shit. And uh, obviously traditional media is in some kind of, I don't even know if we call it a decline. I don't know what it is. Fundamental societal and commercial reset. I Advertising is almost the only way you can punch through to get to some constituents, particularly those supposed who are the to know recipients anything. of government programs. So I, I I don't like I think you must have limits. I don't think that you can be overtly partisan. Um, but I'm I'm just not I'm not I'm not singing in this uh, in this choir. Jordan, 
Yeah. So I saw actually what caught my interest about this was that those ads I also didn't find to be that egregious. And so I think it's really, to me, an interesting question. If you're uh, opposition and not in government, how like how can you hold the government to account for partisan government advertising, which every government does, every government worth their salt does? Actually, you know the feds are not doing it. The feds are not. The feds are not doing it. They're are they? Doing. I don't I see know. anything that I, I would know. consider they got a to be new advocacy ad advertising. They got a new the big me- they got a new big media buyout for an ad about heat pumps, which is pretty good, and it's also pretty goddamn promotional. But uh, I don't think they're going to get. Any Come on, guys! An ad about heat good. pumps? No. <laughs> yes. Uh, look, I, I I've been watching their ads on on. People are loading uh, the pickups with them. Yeah, yeah, like, Jordan, say, Jordan say, wasn't finished. I want to hear what Jordan has to say. Jordan wasn't finished. No. So so my point on this is that I think this is really interesting, right? Because here you've got uh you've got the Auditor General, which you know typically in any province or federally you get a scathing Auditor General's report. That's usually pretty decent ammo. No opposition party is picking up on this. I think it's, it really, to me, it points to the difficulty of if you're not in government, how do you hold the government kind of to account on partisan government advertising, which every government can and should be doing, because that is smart politics. Um, If you even have the AG and you have these rules, which I think in Ontario are a little bit bizarre, although the irony, of course, of the PCs promising to reverse the weakening them and then losing that in the mail when they got elected is like delicious. But how do you do that? How, how, when because people it, promise to do things if elected I that are know. not in their no, self interest, don't expect them Stop. to do it. Don't right? tell me that. <laughs> Was 2015 the last election first past the post? Yeah, it, <laughs> that's, yeah. I it definitely was. Yeah, yeah. That, that, totally, that, that totally happened. But but I think it's really interesting, you know, as like as a new Democrat, obviously, like we think about this a lot because we're maybe not so often able to use these levers, but it's a huge challenge. How do you combat a government that is able to to leverage government advertising? It's a massive challenge. And especially in the day and age where when you do paid advertising on social media, like there's it's it's still very difficult to get good returns on that if you don't have a huge budget. So it's an interesting challenge. If even when you have the AG going out and making that criticism and it's not effectual, it's not actually something that's going to curb that, what is the way that you can do that? So for me, this actually posed, a, I think, maybe a question back to the AG and back to opposition parties in Ontario about how you want to go after that. Because we also know through, like, and I think Global was reporting on this a couple of weeks ago, uh, Ford's got another $2 million budgeted set aside to do this for Ontario Place. So what chance does your message have against this? Uh, how are you going to get organized to confront that? And that was really what I was thinking about when I looked at this clip. Yeah, but it's a lot easier to transmit negative messages than it is to transmit positive messages through media, social media, various other things, right? So You have to do it, though. You have to do it. Corey... Take a step back from this particular issue. Do you have any thoughts on where the bounds of the legitimate use of government advertising and a potentially illegitimate use of government advertising might be? Well, I think I think they're in the act that you mentioned. Like, mm-hmm. I think you shouldn't be using a leader's image. Uh, I don't think you should be obviously using a party logo or anything like that. That would be right. like way across uh, uh, the the line. But you know. Uh, it, it, it is used by essentially every government in North America, probably around the Western world. Like this is not something that is out of out of step or out of bounds in terms of how other governments across the country do business. And you know, everyone's going to lean uh, a little bit on that in terms of what's the color and the complexion of those ads. They're going to talk about the things that are in their budget or that are part of their agenda, and they're going to try to put as nice a uh, a, uh, a coloring and and spin on that as possible. Oh, okay, so what? Right? Like the, the you know, uh, if you're going to make changes, if you're going to have you know, I'm not a big fan of the heat pump pr- uh, program, as you can probably guess. But if you're going to make you know hundreds of millions of dollars available for Canadians to uh, to access heat pumps for their home, don't you think it'd be a good idea to 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 put that out in an ad, like so that people know that it exists? Like it, it, you know, there are legitimate reasons for for doing this stuff. Uh, I think it's the AG being precious. Uh, I think the fact that that you know the, the current government is using the same rules that their predecessors brought in, um, 
isn't shocking. You know? <laughs> and I don't think that if you're to look at those rules, they differ very much from what you see in every other province and, and what you see in terms of the federal government. So, you know, a big shrug of the shoulders for me on this one. So, Scott, why aren't the feds using this? Like, I mean, they, nobody, nobody in Canada thinks they have an economic plan. I don't know if Harper had any more of an economic plan than Trudeau does, but he spent millions and millions of dollars telling Canadians that Canada had an economic action plan. Yep. Right? And why, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't these guys be doing that? The only insight I can offer is that I had a conversation the other day with a journalist who mentioned to me in passing um, the senior liberals were telling her, senior Trudeau liberals, people involved in the political operation and involved in the campaign and involved in um, the government, uh, made the case aggressively. Um, the pre-read advertising doesn't work. Now, I'm talking partisan advertising here. This is overtly partisan advertising. But in, in response to our year-long complaint as to why they've not been advertising as Pierre Polyad, the response was it doesn't work. And it didn't work from Harper against Trudeau, and therefore it doesn't work. And people that advocate that- Therefore, it's never worked. Therefore, it's never worked. And you don't understand the contemporary media landscape and how messages are digitally shared and consumed and how opinion is shaped and influenced. Now, okay. Um, so I, the, all, the only answer I can offer, David, is- I, You know what? That That's if, probably true, but I can still fucking read the polls. <laughs> well, and if, if, if that is true from a partisan perspective when it comes to the advertising they pay uh, for out of their party coffers, maybe that's their attitude with respect um, to the uh, public treasury. And they just don't think that that kind of mass market advertising has much effect. Uh, and I guess the only thing I would add is I think maybe there's also a degree of preciousness. Some of these people were also those folks that proudly declared you know, uh, back in the day in the Ontario government that they wouldn't have anything to do, no trucker trade with partisan advertising out of government departments. And maybe they think that being consistent in their thinking and their uh, perspective on that is more important than actually making a fucking difference. But uh, I don't know. But I don't agree with it and I don't understand it. Maybe the security guards will give them an attaboy as they leave the Longevin block. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's insane. Like, mm. and I, I, I don't know also how they could possibly prove the negative in this case because they haven't fucking tried it, right? Mm. So they have not been out there making this case at all. And you can't you can't make a blanket statement like that. The the situation is very different right now. It's true. The media landscape has changed, but also Trudeau's approval ratings have changed. A lot has changed. So you would actually have to test that. And there really doesn't seem to be a whole lot of evidence that they're even invested in exploring that direction. And I think that's just suicidal. It's madness. Pre-written negative ads do work, by the way. And that's why everybody who wins does them. Right. Um, and but, I mean, everywhere. If you want to bet the farm on that theory, be my guest. But uh, Including their political hero, Barack Obama. Fucking went after Mitt Romney with an axe for negative pre-written. Well, anyway. they, they basically accused him of killing a family dog or something, didn't they? Mm. It was almost that bad. Yeah, so, I mean, it's just uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of malpractice to believe that, if they believe that. So I go down rabbit holes sometimes, usually at night. Who doesn't? Old Saskatchewan Rough Rider, Grey Cup games, Norm Macdonald talk show clips, Habs highlights from the past, old concert videos from the 1970s. I could look at retro stuff for hours. Sometimes I do. The other day, I ran across some old ads that our sponsor, CN, ran 40 years ago or so, back in the 1980s. It's especially fun to watch stuff from a bygone time you remember well. You can find the old CN ads easily enough online. You ever wonder, by the way, who it is in charge of preserving absolutely everything online? Anyway, these ads have scenes like finger dialing a rotary landline phone or a monochrome computer screen dripping green numbers, just like in the Matrix, or hands tapping on one of those old clanky computer keyboards with huge keys or shots of a satellite dish with an unctuous voiceover intoning silent dishes angled at the sky. Like I said, fun to watch, the same way the Partridge family or the Brady Bunch is fun to watch. In a way, though, Those CN ads were ahead of the curve. 
The central message was that railroading was no longer just a locomotive hauling an endless procession of boxcars from point A to point B. That even 40 years ago, businesses that didn't leverage technology would be left behind. The ad talks about using computers to determine where every boxcar and every container is at every moment, where it is bound, and what it contains. Move ahead to 2023, and that sort of data-based business seems unremarkable. CN trains are now heavily computerized, satellite-guided, precision-monitored. They inspect the tracks they roll upon for safety issues, and sensors embedded in the tracks inspect them back in return. But it all has to be in service of the same basic unchanged rule. Trains must depart and arrive on time, come what may. If they don't, our whole economy shudders. Some stuff just doesn't change. Food prices are back in the news. One of the stickiest points in the... uh, Inflation uh, issue. Gail and Weston testifying again last week, this time blaming multinational suppliers for price increases and naming them, by the way. Freeland is trying to pass a bill that will create more competition in the grocery space and force the grocers to be more transparent with the government about pricing. A new report last week said the average family will spend $700 more next year on food. And Jim Stanford says today the grocery profits have doubled since COVID and families are cutting back on the amount of food they buy. Jordan, what's your take <clears throat> on the government's offensive against the grocery industry and on food prices? What offensive? <laughs> like, I just think they, it's like they've stated a series of wishes and and brought everybody together and and now are are surprised when everything's not magically working out so when we talked about this earlier in the fall right ahead of thanksgiving i think we i think i think at this point we unanimously expressed uh i think shock and uh disapproval of the government's brilliant plan to hype up expectations for lower prices ahead of thanksgiving and then hold a press conference to say that didn't quite happen right before thanksgiving and (laughs) Perhaps unsurprisingly, not a lot seems to have evolved in their thinking. So we're now we've now arrived uh, ahead of the holiday season, where people are again buying a lot more food. They're entertaining. They're going out. They're getting the expensive fucking cheese, all that stuff, right? Or they want to because the mother in law is coming. You know, you got to do that stuff. And being hit with the news about the coming increase in gross three prices next year, $700 a family. People are feeling this. Food inflation is not coming down. It's not going to be coming down for people as they experience it. And so to have all of that, that the news coming out of Weston coming to committee last week and where the NDP actually brought brought him again, uh, the minister seems absent on this file. They've been working on this grocery code of conduct between the suppliers and the grocery chains for two years now. And You've got Walmart and Loblaws dragging their feet on signing this as a voluntary thing. You have other grocers on board. Um, and the vast majority of Canadians, Abacus was out in the field on this, uh, would very on much... On everything. Like, yeah. Would be, <laughs> <laughs> busy, busy. It's a busy season, you know. They would very much like to see this be mandatory. And it's just cricket. So my takeaway on this is that you've got, like, you've got probably the best supervillain in, in the Canadian political sphere right now, Galen Weston sitting there. Remember, this is the guy with a $12 million salary last year uh, sitting there. He makes 431 times more than his average employee. OK, so you've got Loblaws workers who need to go to the fucking food bank because they can't actually buy the groceries that they sell. And this guy gets basically a free ride from the government to come and gum up this Again, really a minimal ask, a voluntary code of conduct, just so small grocers in Canada aren't squeezed out and there's a little bit more competition. We are not even talking about hard, hard measures like price caps or anything like that, which, by the way, I think we probably should be considering. We're not even talking about that. And the government is nowhere to be seen leading this. I think they're leaving the field open for the NDP on this issue, which has just like a beautiful set of enemies that Canadians resonate with on an issue that Canadians experience day to day. 
This has just been absolutely fumbled and dropped by them. And I remain gobsmacked because it's like this past week, they basically had a redo of the shit show of Thanksgiving and they did nothing. You know, this is a, by the way, not a nothing issue. eh? like, um, I know that for upper middle class people, rising food prices are an annoyance or an inconvenience or something. But for lots of people, have huge real world implications about how much food you eat, what kind of food you buy. Incidences of food insecurity in this country have soared over the last couple of years. Um, like there's real food poverty out there. <clears throat> Is this all window dressing? Should the government be doing more? What can the government be doing? You asking me? Anybody? I, uh, look, I, I, Look, I, I think the bully pulpit is, you know, does have some value. Uh, I think hauling the Galen Westons of the world to committee is, is isn't a bad thing in and of itself. I, I would tend to agree with Jordan. It's a little light on on follow through in terms of actual measures. But, you know, I'm also not, you know, going to endorse like wage and price controls. Uh, you know, a la 1970s. I don't think that's the way to go either. Uh, but I do, I do hear what you're saying on the on the food insecurity. I see it uh, driving by the food bank in my in my neighborhood, uh, where uh, there are significant lineups. There are there, and the people that you see in those lines are are looking pretty middle class to me. You know, they're they're maybe not upper middle class, but like they, these are regular folks. And uh, I wonder if there isn't something more that we could be doing to to buttress that sector. Uh, to perhaps create some some incentives for these large retailers who are making re- record profits to to do more in that area. And if, you know, if I were to counsel those folks, I'm you know I'm, I don't don't have any clients in in, in that space particularly. But uh, I, I would voluntarily come to the, the table and talk about some additional things like that that you're doing to to help alleviate these pressures. Because uh, right now I think they're wearing a big black cowboy hat when they're sitting in these uh, committee meetings. And I don't think that's good for their shareholders or their corporate reputations. I, I think there's there's more that they could come to the table with if they want to stave off some of the more heavy-handed things that, that uh, uh, Jordan and uh, the NDP would be pushing the government to do otherwise. Well, you know, polling I've seen would argue that uh, the uh, behavior of Loblaws during COVID has wiped out what would have been Hundreds of millions of dollars of portray- of portraying Galen Weston as a nice man in a sweater vest who cared in a sweater who cared about you, uh, because the grocers Loblaws used to have one of the best reputations in the country, and grocer reputations, including theirs, have sunk to shit. Yeah, and sorry, like dude went to committee last week and argued that it's 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 all well and good that Loblaws has record quarter over quarter profit growth. So it was 13% quarter over quarter last year because that's what a successful business does. Meanwhile, you've got their own employees in food bank lines. Like, fuck off. Like this is they're not doing themselves every time he appears, he's digging it deeper. Yeah, their their throats are completely exposed because their fundamental message, and it's a boardroom message, right? Like meaning that before you come to committee, before you're going to be subject to an interview, you sit around a boardroom with people and talk about what you're going to say. And, and you got a boardroom message, which is like, you know what? You know who the real victims are in this? Us. Like when they prayed us out, you know, in this unseemly way to throw rotten tomatoes at us, which by the way, people have to pick up later because it's the only fucking food they can afford. And, and, <laughs> and you know, we're, we're so badly oh treated. God. And the truth of the matter is that, you know, I'm, I'm an ocean of despair and skepticism these days, politically speaking. Like I just kind of like my, my every answer to your every question, David, could be, I don't know. It doesn't fucking matter. Like that's kind of how I feel right now. I, I was emotionally depleted at the end of last week's show. And I don't know how I can do this anymore for the next year and a half, but exactly, you know, and, and, uh, but I do think since our advice has consistently been to the government, you know what? If you look around the room and you can't find the villain, then you're the villain. So get out of that room and find a villain. I think, you know, given that that's our advice, I'm not going to shit on the government for going after them. I am going to share some of the concerns <laughs> expressed by my friend Jordan, which is I don't think they've been very effective. I don't think that this this stick has been very uh, p- pointed and they need to sharpen it when they poke it at him, especially when his testimony basically is, listen, ah, uh, like... I, I'm doing uh, I'm doing great, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to. So piss off and get out of my uh, way. And I just think they're very vulnerable. And I think the government um, it, it might want to go back 
uh, so to speak, to the shelf, to the cupboard, and look around, not for cans of soup, but for ideas that would hit harder, that would sting more, and would maybe have some political punch in it. Because I don't think their strategy is wrong, but I don't think their execution is making a difference. And mm. I I don't want to let our friends of the blue team completely off the hook, though, last week on the issue of food prices and, and insecurity, because they also did a dumb thing last week. They voted against a PMB on a school food program. What the fuck? Like, why would you do that? Like, there's 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 no need to make that carbon tax a battlefront. This is moronic. <laughs> this is moronic. My friends, you are too deep in the bunker. You are you are opening a flank. Think about this stuff. I would like a national school food program, by it, the way. This is actually something that the federal Big government time. can really have a hand in. We know also school food You get at programs, least one decent meal into a kid a day, yeah. you're going to make a difference. No kids learning on empty stomach. And these school food programs, by the way, have are massively under financial pressure right now because more and more kids are coming to school hungry. Food prices are up. They need they need funding, and mm. this is something the feds can help with. And sh like, surely to God, even in this dysfunctional place, we could all agree on that. Yeah. All right. Hey, you know what? I have an idea. I have an idea. We we have we have a little bit of time left. We have a little bit of time left, and so I I'm thinking about doing my hey you first, and having you Perfect. people comment on my hey you. Perfect. Because I think it could lead to a discussion. Okay. Let's all right. It. All right, Mr. Pinson. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. So my hey you goes out to Quebec. What's happening over there? Legault has gone from a hero to a bum in a nanosecond. All of a sudden, well behind. Far from straddling like a colossus, he's well behind. The PQ are off their deathbed and leading in the polls. So there you've got a you've got a conservative party that's suddenly fallen dramatically and a left-wing party that has surged to the top provincially. And at the same time what we're seeing in the federal numbers and nobody's talking about this enough is the move the federal conservatives are making in Quebec and that they now have poll after poll is showing their numbers competitive or better than the liberal numbers. And so the liberals are sometimes even third in Quebec. And it looks like at the moment they would only hold on to their English and allophone Montreal ridings, which is the 20 to 22 ridings that Turner wins in 84. And um, so you just start doing the math across the country and it gets pretty serious if you're down to 20, 22 seats in Quebec. So I'm not sure what's going on. It doesn't seem ideologically driven, but Quebec is the place to watch in Canadian politics right now. Well, I, I just came back from Montreal. I was there on Saturday uh, to, um, uh, sorry, Friday and Saturday to, to see my, my good friend, Dr. Luc Lavoie, and, uh, and to get his take on all this, uh, because I, I'm as curious as you are. Uh, David, but you can fill the Encyclopedia Britannica with all the information that I don't know about the uh, you know, inner workings and interplay of, of political parties. But his take uh, sort of resonated with me that you know this has been you know, uh, month after month of fumbling of meat and potatoes issues and self-inflicted wounds around sort of you know government administration. They made big changes to how for Lego for Lego like big yeah. changes to how you you get your your driver's license and things like that. They put in a new IT system. They said, we're going to close our, our service outlets for, for three weeks to stand this thing up. And then when they try to stand it up, the thing doesn't work. And so you had, you know, truckers who couldn't get the paperwork they need to, to, you know, take their goods across the border. You had, you know, just all kinds of disruption and, you know, uh, seemingly the, the, the government and the minister responsible just just absolutely shit the bed. What's the point of Mussolini when the trains don't so, run on time? Yeah, right, right exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. like, I think that didn't that didn't really work. Uh, and they've just had a lot of self-inflicted wounds, it sounds like. But, you know, when you, when you carry that forward to the federal situation, you know, his take was uh, that he can see Polyev winning 2025 seats in the next election. If, if that happens, it's uh, bedtime for Bonzo uh, for the Liberal Party. For sure. So, you know, I think they should be super concerned about that. So, yeah, things, things seem to be moving. Um, I'm, I'm very curious to see how it all continues to play out. But, you know, uh, I, I think your take there is, is bang on. You know, if, if you're going to 
if you're going to be uh, the Mussolini, you better you better have <laughs> the trains running on time. <laughs> Although, you know, I know uh, somebody's going to throw a, a, a beer glass at me for, for making that comparison. Uh, I don't think uh, Legault's Mussolini, by the way. Although, you know, the, I've never liked the undertone of uh, xenophobia and nativism in Quebec politics generally, and he certainly has embodied, embodied that part of it for a number of years. But... Mm-hmm. Uh, there's another party that will give all voters there all of those same things, and it's called the Parti Québécois. And if it looks like they're going to administer the province more effectively, then you know you're going to lose that that wedge. Right. Yeah. No, I, I largely agree with you and Corey. I think this was this is overwhelmingly self inflicted crisis for like, oh, these are these are decisions that he's made and balls that he's found. You know, he's picked a few too many fights with English speaking Quebecers. And that has certainly um, unified people. But I think the biggest issues that are driving this is you've got massive labor disruption with the common front strikes that are happening um, that are poised to continue. Like at this point, I think they're, they're set to go until the 14th, but that like, you know, you talk, you talk to people in Quebec, they've got their kids home from school. Like this is a really big deal for people's day-to-day lives. And the other thing is like the health system's on the brink of collapse. You've got overflowing ERs um, at, you know, really just scary capacity. Um, And and I think people uh, really don't have a lot of tolerance for the shit that Lego wants to pull when those basics are not working, when they are, when they, and this is, as you say, this is the meat and potato stuff that they're not getting right. And so they are going to look elsewhere. And as we know, the Quebec electorate looks elsewhere quickly, decisively, uh, and, and in great numbers. And I think that it's exactly that tendency that should absolutely worry the liberals. Like their numbers aren't as soft in Quebec yet as they are elsewhere. And maybe that, maybe that's a, a bit of a silver lining for them. But if those start to go and they start to go in a big way, you can expect major trouble. And I think that one of the things that they need to be especially concerned about is what we talked about last week. If you start to see the NDP creeping up and surpassing the Liberals outside of Quebec, that also gets Quebecers looking around because they don't want to be on on the losing end of that equation with the progressive vote either. So I think it's a reason why that can, can really quickly become a death spiral. Scott, I could try to drill in on Jordan and about why the NDP are flat on their ass in Quebec, that there can be all kinds of movement in Quebec in favor of different political parties, but the NDP don't get any of it. But I don't want to do that because I want to stay depressed about myself. (laughs) And I want to say that last week I was focused on the fact that the Liberals had lost women over the age of 50. And now I'm focused on the fact that we're losing Quebec. And I just like, what the fuck is left? I know. It's literally, <laughs> it's it's like you're sitting in your home and the bill collectors have come and there's no furniture left. And you're like, how how did I get so long so fast? Um, I would, I would I, say you could tear up the floorboards and put them in the fireplace, but that's being banned by the government. So um, I do think it, it's, uh, well, let me just add to the depression. I feel, man, I feel that melancholy uh, and, and, and sense of hopelessness as well. Um and you know you gotta guard against that because politics is politics, but um, and and things can change and things can change on a dime. As Legault was learning, by the way, just incidentally, I I, I don't want to pretend to know anything about Quebec politics, but I think Legault is singularly qualified to handle this kind of political turn poorly. I don't. He's he's the kind of guy who's he's such an autocrat. He's you know his his political life as premier has been you know punching down and leading with thirty points, and I just think that he'll be very very bad at managing his way out of criticism. I think he's going to bristle. I think he will break, not bend. I think it's going to be quite a spectacle to watch. And and I think that that's dangerous because I think that that could reward the Parti Québécois. I think that it could upset the federal political apple cart. I think it's a specific just to get back to us being depressed and finding the worst possible implication for the federal liberals in this, David. I think it's a specific threat to the federal liberals because I think it could create irrational thinking and weird decisions. And I mean that because... Without the anchor argument of, well, Trudeau uh, provides us with a shot of 30, 35 seats in Quebec, then then the non-existent, other than Percy, uh, effort by, within the Liberal Party to push him out of his job, it could come together. You know, you could start to see people say, well, hang on, you know, without that, without that Quebec anchor, that Quebec anchoring 
and intimidating. It's also an intimidating argument for non-Quebecers within the Liberal Party. You know, without that, um, then you know it could become people could start to become brazen, and it could also pervert what they think is a logical choice. Well, fuck! If Quebec's lost to us anyway, then why do we need a Quebecer? Then what's even the point? And suddenly you take yourself down the road of well, let's elect somebody who's you know that doesn't even compete in English in French Canada, and then and, and you know what's the difference anyway? And uh, let's give ourselves a chance of renewal. And you end up picking like you know fucking Michael Ignatieff or something, you know. And so that's that's my worry is that this. Again, like I just sound like such a negative Nancy, but Jesus Christ, it could, it could, it could swirl in a in an, in an already bleak looking twenty twenty four. It could, it could swirl right out of control, um, and you could add to the current problems of the federal Liberal Party internal division, open breaching d- division, and uh, and Joker's wild choices. It just it it's fucking awful. Well, any Quebec, any liberal strategy that says Quebec should just be what it is, let it fucking go, and will focus on English Canada, does not understand how every liberal government in Canadian history has been built. No question. Right. But right. don't you know, David, that's why Gilbo is still environment minister. Yeah, that is probably he true. He hasn't quit yet. Mm. So. All right. Well, how about the rest of your hey yous? Who wants to fire up a hey you? Well, I, I'm happy to go. I was going to do Scott McCord, but we seen, I feel, kind of feel like we totally covered that one on the front end. So uh, I'm going to uh, play an audible here and throw my hey you out to the folks at Creative Currency, uh, namely Dennis Matthews, good friend of the podcast, and, uh, and the Hurley Burley, uh, uh, David Tarrant, and Lauren McDonald, who, uh, who put together all, all these things. Anybody else in that seen. shop work on that ad? Uh, not I, my son, if that's, that's what, you're what I'm asking. Her. That's yeah. what I'm asking. Well, no, I, I, I don't not. Think, I'm, I'm not sure he worked worked on it. Uh, I think Max over there did as well. There's, you know, they've got a really good team, but I want to throw a shout out to them because I think they've been cranking out uh, some of the very best political uh, advertising out there. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, a little more on the conservative ledger, but I know their core business Hello. is really about about doing that kind of advertising, but. Uh, yeah, just a joy to work with and, uh, and, uh, you know, A++ stuff coming out of there all the time. Hey, Corey, do we have permission to run the ad? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, uh, there, there's two 30-second spots for the, the TV spots. All right, well, let's fire up one. We'll show one. Bonnie Crombie? Oh, the new Ontario Liberal leader. Of course, friends with Justin Trudeau. Bonnie's got a beachfront house in the Hamptons. Ugh, fancy. And she's always been a big fan of a carbon tax. She even increased taxes as mayor. In this economy? Ugh, tax, tax, tax. Sounds expensive. No, thank you. Bonnie Crombie and the Ontario Liberals. They just don't get it. That will cost you. A message from the Ontario PC Party. Uh, I'm going to go next. My hey you is the speaker. like, And the speaker's thing. Like, you know, first we're inviting Nazis and we have to like talk about the speaker and have a controversy about the speaker and he's got to be, be removed. And now Greg Are speakers Fergus, more trouble than they're worth. Yeah. It's like, what? Well, this one is. <laughs> Can we go could, back you know, to not talking about speakers? There's going to be some AI that could help us with this. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to firmly jump in and do a both hands on this one. I, I'm going to say that the conservatives are hysterical when they say that he needs to be removed. That's ridiculous. The uh, crime doesn't fit that punishment. But I will say that Greg Fergus get some fucking judgment. So ridiculous that you would appear at a party convention in your robes in the in 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 the in the accoutrement of office. Like that is not right. You've been involved in politics. I've known you since you were eighteen. You've been involved in politics your entire adult life. And if you don't know better, you should know better. Uh, it was just so fucking blockheaded. And and but and- isn't there some chance he didn't intend it to be used for that? There was a private party for Fraser at Fraser's house that a bunch of political people went to as a celebration. I wouldn't be surprised if that's what the video was intended for, and he was as surprised as anybody to see it at the convention. Well, uh, okay, that's a little. That's a little bit. Paul, uh, if that's if that's true, then that's a little bit uh, uh, re- relieving. Then I suppose, but he still shouldn't have even done that event in his speaker's robes. I'm sorry, he just shouldn't have. Like it. It just it smacks up. Get a load of where I am now, eh? Huh? Huh? Fucking check it out, right? I got, mm. I got like a, I got a house. I mean, I got a house. Like it just, 
just just the gear down house on the his own brand, he's got his own brand of whiskey scott like <laughs> yeah. so you should have seen anyway. him swanning around with paul ryan like the canadian speaker and the american speaker were the same job or something yeah. anyway jordan but i say i like greg but he really he needs to stop making news so i think that's that's the main message there um, so my Hey You this week goes out to a gentleman by the name of Peter Puxley, um, who some of you may know as the former Parliamentary Bureau Chief for CBC Radio. Uh, got sad news that he passed away suddenly last week, but I met Peter in one of his political staff roles. He actually uh, hired me for my first job on the Hill when he was Leighton's Director of Research and Policy. Um, and Peter was a just a really fabulous guy, an economist. He was a journalist. He was an organizer, a writer, uh, just a lifetime agitator and rabble rouser, really of the best sort. And he was a kind, funny mentor and really passionate about making change. And he's he's really going to be missed. So um, I hate you uh, this week is going out to Peter and deepest condolences to to Lois and his kids, uh, Chinta Luke and Kate. Here, here. Oh, thank you, Jordan. Yeah, thank you. All right, folks, that's it for this week. Thank you for watching, listening, whatever you did. Thank you, Jordan, Scott, Corey, for being here. Always fun. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and to our sponsor, CN Rail, for their... You know what? I just want to I just want to give a shout-out to these folks because, honest to God, listeners, watchers, they don't ever ask us to talk about something or ask us not to talk about anything. Never once have they made any suggestion about the content of this show and it's a purely kind of altruistic uh, support for this show that is um, really welcome. So I thank them uh, for it additionally. And uh, any of you that remember what we said at the beginning, go to the Apple Ratings and Review Machine. Give us a shout out there somehow. And thank you all of you who posted your Spotify listening charts last week. That was a lot of fun. That was fun. That was a lot of fun also. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week with more of The Curse of Politics.